Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for tonight's webinar, uh, which is titled Hurricanes in a Warming World, featuring Dr. Pinaki Chakaborty. While we are waiting for everyone to join, we have about 100 people joining us tonight. I'd love to ask everyone who's signing in now, it's about 30 people at the moment, uh, if you could write in chat where you are joining us from. We would love to hear if you're joining us from uh, somewhere in Japan. And if you are, tell us where. Uh, if you're joining us from the United States, we'd love to hear where. And uh, if you're joining us from other countries, uh, please write that as well. So uh, those of you joining us, um, let us know where you are joining from. And so far, we've got Hawaii, Florida, Canada, uh, OIST, Tokyo. Um, and I'm sure there's going to be many more. New Jersey, another person in Okinawa, uh, Coral Gables, Florida, Virginia. Um, so uh, quite a nice group, Honolulu as well, uh, Brandeis University in Massachusetts, uh, China, uh, Washington, DC. So really fabulous group. And uh, again, we're expecting about 100 people. So I think uh, a number more will be uh, joining soon, but we will get underway. So once again, uh, good evening if you're in the United States, good afternoon if you're on the West Coast or Hawaii, and good morning if you're in Japan or other parts of Asia. Once again, tonight's webinar, which is part of the OIST Foundation's Future of Climate webinar series, uh, is titled Hurricanes in a Warming World. Uh, I'm David Jaynes of the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology Graduate University and the US-based OIST Foundation. For those of you who are not familiar, OIST, the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology Graduate University, is an interdisciplinary graduate school offering a five-year PhD program in science. And the main task of OIST is to produce groundbreaking, cutting-edge research for the benefit of all humankind. The OIST Foundation is a one-year-old United States-based 501c3 nonprofit organization, we're based in New York, that supports scientific breakthroughs, innovation, and the sustainable development of Okinawa through OIST. And we began this Future of Climate series late last year with support from the Japan Foundation Center for Global Partnerships. We did three webinars, and we're uh, very pleased to be able to continue them. This is going to be essentially our fourth uh, with Dr. Pinaki Chakraborty as our featured speaker tonight. And let me tell you just a little bit about him. He is a professor in the Fluid Mechanics Unit at OIST, and he directs that unit which uses a combination of theory, experiments, and simulations uh, to work on turbulent flows, geological flows, atmospheric flows, and granular flows. And I think as many of you know who signed up, in a groundbreaking article titled Slower Decay of Landfalling Hurricanes in a Warming World, which was published in Nature in November of last year, uh, Dr. Chakraborty and co-author Lynn Lee they described results of their research that suggests that as the world continues to warm, the destructive power of hurricanes will extend progressively farther inland. And this research and its implications uh, have been featured in the press all around the world from the New York Times, BBC, CNN, Washington Post, Der Spiegel, Fox News, Nature News and Views, and beyond. Uh, so we're really delighted to have you here with us, Pinaki, uh, to hear directly from you about your research. And without further ado, I'll turn the floor over to you. And thank you. Uh, thank you very much, David, for the kind invitation and the generous introduction. And thank you, everybody around the world for taking the time off to attend this talk. So as David mentioned, I'll be talking about hurricanes in a warming world. Uh, I'll describe research results based on PhD research done by Lin Lee. I should add, uh, when we embarked on this research, neither Lynn nor I knew much about hurricanes. And it's been an interesting journey to try to uh, learn and understand a few aspects of this very interesting and a complex problem of how hurricanes and climate are related. Okay, so let me start by making a few very general remarks about a warming world. I'll start with this curve. So what I'm showing here are measurements of the average global temperature in the post-industrial era. And as you can see, year to year, there may be some variations, but overall the trend is that the temperature has been increasing. And if we particularly look in the last 60 years or so, there's been a very steep and significant increase in the average global temperature 
by about a degree Celsius over this time or uh, about two degrees Fahrenheit. So it's very clear. And these things, by the way, are uh, very well uh, understood and utterly non-controversial among the climate scientists that the average global temperature is increasing. Not only is the part in consensus that the average global temperature is increasing, but the reason for the increase is also very well understood. And just to get to grasp with that, here in the black curve is the same average global temperature. And in this graph, I'm also showing you in green, what are the effects of natural drivers? So non-human related things, for example, uh, solar energy changing, things like that. And over this period in the post-industrial era, effectively the natural effects are minimal. So it's not really anything that's changing in nature that's causing this increase in the global temperature. But rather, as you can see in the orange curve, it's humans. It's us who is driving this increase of the global temperature. And when I say as humans are driving, what I'm specifically referring to majority of this increase is because of the greenhouse gases that's been injected in the atmosphere. And again, this aspect is also very well understood and non-controversial amongst climate scientists. I'm adding this caveat because topics of global warming uh, sometimes tends to get very political, which is quite unfortunate. In any event, so the globe has been warming and one could naturally ask the question, well, okay, so what? What are the effects of a warming world? And there are many, many effects of a warming world, most of them quite destructive for human civilization. Um, for example, uh, rising sea level. As the globe keeps warming, sea level continues to rise. The part that I will focus on is a more complex connection. It's the connection between a warming world and hurricanes. So let me make a few general remarks about hurricanes. Here's a schematic of a hurricane. A hurricane essentially is a gigantic, it's a massive swirling spinning storm. And when I say massive, let me give you a sense of what scales we're talking about. The diameter of a hurricane can be of the order of a thousand kilometers or about 600 miles. And the thickness of the hurricane can span the whole breadth of the whole height of the troposphere, which is about 15 kilometers, about eight miles or so. so it's really, really big. And also this, as I mentioned, it's a spinning storm. It can carry intense velocities. So the spinning velocity in a category five hurricane, for example, can be north of 250 kilometers an hour, about 150 miles an hour. So it's really, really intense. And I should also add, because there are audience, not just from the US, but from other parts that hurricanes are known by other names in different parts of the world. So for example, in Japan and in Western Pacific, hurricanes are known as typhoons. Typhoons, hurricanes, it's exactly the same weather phenomena. In some other parts of the world, they are known as cyclones. The scientific name is tropical cyclones. But- Inaki, sorry to interrupt, but can you forward your slide to the next one so people can see? Thank you. I, I already did, so let me try to see. So is the- Hurricane slide up here. Oh, it just shows why is the world warming. So the slides are not changing, you mean? Right. Okay, let me try to. Apologies. <laughs> Zoom, Zoom business always has some unwelcome surprises. I teach. No problem. Also. Everyone in the audience, I'm sure, is familiar with that. And if you want to maybe stop sharing and reshare, that's a yeah, possibility. I'll, I'll do exactly that. So let me stop sharing. Sorry about this. And I'll reshare. Okay, so let's see if we can. Okay, is, is, is now the new slide about hurricanes and a schematic of a hurricane? Uh, no, we actually don't see anything at the moment. Uh, it says double click to enter full screen mode. Let's see. Okay, let me stop sharing and share the screen again. For everyone in the audience, I'm sure you, you've all experienced many uh, 
experiences with Zoom. So we will work through this. Don't worry. <laughs> we just did a good test with Panaki's slides and they all worked fine. So I'm sure we'll get them back up here in a second. Um, all right, so let's see if it works this time. How about now? Uh, okay, so we see the warming world slide. All right. Oh, yes, why is the world warming? And, and now we have it. Perfect. Thank you so right. much, Naki. Appreciate uh, thanks it. A lot. Thanks, everyone, for bearing with us. Um, yeah, I'm sorry about this. Uh, Zoom has always brought in some rather unwelcome surprises for me. In any event, so uh, hurricanes, cyclones, typhoons, they're all the same weather phenomena. And what I'm showing in this slide is a schematic of this monster, this massive swirling spinning storm. Uh, as you might imagine, the physics of hurricanes is quite complicated, but for hurricanes, so-called mature hurricanes, hurricanes that have developed to full size, uh, there are conceptual models that can very well capture the salient features, many salient features in a hurricane. And the conceptual model is that of imagining of a hurricane as a heat engine. So what's a heat engine? A heat engine is something that converts heat into motion. A, a typical example of that is for example, an engine in a car. It burns the fuel, gasoline, say, and the released heat is then converted into motion of the car. In a hurricane, the fuel happens to be essentially the moisture that's coming from the ocean underneath. And the heat from that moisture is converted by the hurricane heat engine into the intense spinning winds in a hurricane. So that's the conceptual picture of a massive nature's heat engine, a hurricane heat engine. And this conceptual picture also allows us to think and to kind of put in context what happens to a hurricane in a warming world. So in, as the world warms, the ocean warms, the air warms, this creates conditions so that the hurricane gets fed more moisture and warm air can hold more moisture. So it, a hurricane will have more moisture in it. In other words, the hurricane heat engine has enhanced amount of fuel, the moisture from the ocean in a warming world. And we might anticipate that because there is this additional fuel available, a hurricane can become more intense. And that picture is quite correct insofar it goes, but it's important to realize that a hurricane is not just affected by sea surface temperature and presence of moisture, but there are a number of other effects that can also have a dominant influence on hurricane dynamics. And what happens to a hurricane in a warming world is a sum total of all of these effects. If we talk about some concrete examples, if we take the example, for example, number of hurricanes. Although it might seem from recent news reports that the number of hurricanes has been increasing, over a long time period, so let's say of the period of many years, decades, and longer, in that time scale, essentially the number of hurricanes has remained more or less constant. So there, if there is an effect of warming world on the number of hurricanes, that seems to be a very, very small signal, effectively imperceptible. But if you ask a different question, okay, so the total number of hurricanes is roughly the same, but what about the fraction of the more intense hurricanes? Well, here, and I hope the slide has changed, here I'm showing the fraction of hurricanes, the, fraction of intense hurricanes over the last, uh, since 1980 or so. This was a recent study, a very, very careful study done by Jim Cousins and others. And what it very clearly established with a very careful analysis of data is that the fraction of very intense hurricanes has significantly gone up since 1980. And that's precisely what we would expect from the part of an warming world creating conditions that are conducive for more intense hurricanes. But these are hurricanes over oceans. If you ask a more selfish question, which is, well, okay, fine, that's happening over ocean. I'm pointing in that direction because I'm in Okinawa and ocean is in that direction. Uh, but we are living on land. What happens to hurricanes that actually make landfall, hit land? Is there an effect of a warming world on those fraction of hurricanes that make landfall. Well, here is an analysis that we did for North Atlantic hurricanes. And 
over the same time period since about 1980 or so. If you look at the average intensity of hurricanes making landfall, what you see is, yeah, there are some variations year to year, but basically it's a flat curve. So the average intensity is not changing much. Likewise, if we start to look at what's the average number of land, number of hurricanes that's making landfall, that's also effectively flat. The number is not changing. So we might very nicely assume or conclude that, yes, the world is warming, but its effect on the hurricanes that make landfall is effectively not there. So somehow we have been lucky. And that seems like a pretty reasonable assumption, but it all depends on what is it that we are looking at. So if you are looking at the number of hurricanes and if you're looking at the intensity of hurricanes, there indeed is no effect. But what if we start to ask a different question? We ask the question, and this is the question that animated Lynn's research, is that what happens to a hurricane after it hits land? And that's the part I'll focus on now. To understand what happens to hurricanes when it hits land, it's helpful to consider a very simple conceptual model. So I talked earlier about the model of a heat engine. And that model itself tells us or gives us hints to what we should be expecting. When a hurricane is over warm ocean, there is fuel supplied to the engine, the engine is running and it's creating intense winds. When a hurricane makes landfall, meaning moves over land, well, the ocean fuel supply is cut off. So imagine you're driving your car and then suddenly you turn off the fuel supply. Lacking fuel, the engine can no longer produce motion and because of friction with the air and the ground, the car will slow down. Effectively, something very similar happens to a hurricane. When a hurricane is over ocean, there is fuel supply available. When a hurricane moves over land, the fuel supply is cut off and the hurricane starts to decay. And this decay process is thought to be very well described by something called a spin down vortex, which can be understood with a very simple analogy, that of a cup of tea. So here I took a video from YouTube and what this shows is that there's a cup of tea, in this case a glass of tea, and imagine that you're stirring this cup of tea. This stirring is the hurricane over ocean and the stirring is the hurricane heat engine working, being fueled by the moisture from the ocean. But when you stop stirring, the swirling tea then slows down. And that's what this video illustrates. This tea was swirling, but now this swirling tea, because of friction with the walls of this glass, is going to slow down and effectively this tea hurricane is going to decay. And essentially the same process happens when a hurricane makes landfall. When a hurricane moves from ocean to land, because of friction with the land underneath, the hurricane slows down, it decays. Let's get a sense of what kind of decay this is. So here is the very well-known case of Hurricane Katrina, which made landfall in 2005 near New Orleans. The destruction was absolutely insane. Uh, about 18, more than 1,800 fatalities, uh, more than $100 billion in damages, levees breaking, you name it, an absolutely disastrous event. So on the left-hand side, I'm showing the track that this hurricane took place. And if you can see the mouse, this is where the hurricane entered the Gulf of Mexico, intensified quite a bit, and then made landfall near New Orleans. And on the right-hand side, I'm showing the intensity of a hurricane. And the intensity of a hurricane is a measure of the maximum velocity in a hurricane. From the time it made landfall and as it's going further inland. So from this point, as it's going further inland. And what you can see is that indeed cut off from the ocean, this maximum velocity or the intensity of a hurricane decays very rapidly. And the rapid decay is really over the period of one day after which the decay slows down. So I'm going to focus attention on this first day past the decay. And I'm going to ask a question, what happens to this rate of decay, to this decay of hurricane, as the climate warms. Now, a priori, it seems to be a very trivial question because we already know, we have already seen that the hurricanes that are making landfall, their intensity is not changing. It's basically a constant instant intensity over a long time period. And our swirling teacup model, which I'll come back to again in this talk, that tells us, well, 
after a hurricane has made the made landfall it's decays because of friction with the land and there is no direct effect of climate on this friction with the land so what you would expect is that this decay more or less is the same for different kinds of hurricanes so a priori there is really no good reason no prudent reason to go and study this problem but if we don't care about prudence and we still study the problem well what do we find so what we do is over the period of half century we study many many land falling hurricanes from the north atlantic in the east coast of north america and here i'm showing the tracks of each of the land falling hurricane that we study from the moment of landfall to one day past landfall we look at how the intensity has decayed and here is a schematic of how the intensity decays with time this rapid decay can be very well described by a function known as exponential decay and what is relevant to this talk is that there's just a single parameter a parameter that i'm going to call tau the decay time scale that tells me the whole shape of this function so for each of the hurricanes that made landfall we calculate this value of tau by looking at how the intensity decayed over the first day past landfall and then from hurricane to hurricane the value of tau can vary quite a bit because hurricane decay can be affected by many factors but we are interested in studying if there is a climatic signature on this decay so we average the decay over hurricanes within a certain local time period let's say of the period of about 5 years and then we look at over the period of this whole 50 years how does this decay time scale evolve before i show you the results let's anticipate what we are going to see so i calculate this decay time scale we have already seen that the intensity of the incoming hurricanes on an average is the same we have also seen that the decay conceptually is essentially because of friction with the ground and there is no good reason to think that the friction with the ground has been changing so what we anticipate to see is a boring curve just like the average intensity curve we anticipate to see basically a flat curve but when len computed this curve we saw a very very interesting curve we saw the average time scale tau going through these kinds of up and down oscillations and these oscillations are about a very clear increasing trend and if we look at this increasing trend then what we find is that let's say 50 years ago on average a hurricane this time scale tau was about 17 hours and to get a sense of this tau we can think of tau not just as a parameter to describe this curve but the value of tau corresponds to the decay in the intensity compared to the intensity at landfall by about two thirds so the intensity becomes one third of its value at landfall from in the time tau so in 17 hours 50 years ago the intensity would decay to one third of its value but if we take an average hurricane now that time has almost doubled it now takes about 33 hours in other words the decay has slowed down very significantly over the past half century if we take another closer look we do see that there's a very clear increase in the decay time scale but also very clear are very substantial ups and downs oscillations about this increase so of course when you see curves like this you ask the natural question why what is causing this change of decay first of all we didn't expect the decay to change at all effectively we were expecting a boring flat curve but instead we find that there's an increase and not just there's an increase there are all these oscillations about this increase what's causing this stuff and this is where lens creativity became very useful so we started to think about the problem and we thought well okay what if although there is no reason to expect that climate has any role on this changes in the decay time scale what if that expectation is wrong what if we look at the sea surface temperature which is a pretty good proxy for the climate computed over the hurricane season and in a region close to the coast and we see how does the sea surface temperature evolve over this same time period and here in black is the decay time scale tau and in orange is the sea surface temperature and what you can see is that both tau and the sea surface temperature are increasing but interestingly 
the sea surface temperature also has these ups and downs. And it appears that these ups and downs of the sea surface temperature are echoed, are reflected in the ups and downs of this decay time scale. So this suggests that there is perhaps a climatic connection to the decay of hurricanes after landfall. Somehow the ups and downs in the sea surface temperature may be causing changes in the decay time scale. Now we have to be careful here because just because two curves are correlated, meaning they have similar kinds of ups and down shapes, it does not necessarily mean that they are actually connected. And you can Google this word phrase spurious correlation, and it's truly a very entertaining uh, experience to see many, many interesting examples. I've wasted a lot of time looking at such examples, so I'll share one with you. Here, from 1999 to 2009, the red curve shows the number of letters in the spelling bee contest, which is a contest uh, where people are asked to spell rather difficult words. So number of letters in the spelling bee contest of in the winning word. And that's, you can see, goes up and down from something like 10 letters to 15 letters, whatever. And in the same time period, the black curve shows you the number of people who died because of being bitten by venomous spiders. And as you can see, this also has this ups and downs. And in fact, these two curves seem to be quite well correlated. Their ups and downs are of a very similar kind. But it would be absurd to suggest that one of them is cause and another one of them is effect. These are two things that just happen to have similar shapes, but there is no connection between the two. So I think the point is clear that just because we saw there's a correlation between the sea surface temperature and the decay time scale, it doesn't necessarily mean that these two things are causally linked, that they are connected. So to understand whether or not there is in fact a link between the two, we go from real world to world in a computer. We simulate hurricanes. What Lin did is he used a state of the art hurricane simulation tool that was developed by the National Center for Atmospheric Research, NCAR in Colorado. And this is a freely available tool and it's open source. So one can go understand how this works and also tweak around the code, which Lin had to do. And what he did is he developed a hurricane over the ocean and the ocean sea surface temperature is kept constant. The, and the example that I'm going to show you right now, the ocean sea surface temperature was 20, about 26 degrees Celsius. So this hurricane developed to a mature state over the ocean. And when it reached an intensity, which is remember the maximum wind speeds in a hurricane, about 60 meters per second, which I have it here. So we have a sense in the different units. It's about 130 miles per hour or about 210 kilometers per hour. Um, it's a category three, category four hurricane, very intense. He cut off the ocean supply completely. In other words, this hurricane developed over ocean and then this hurricane made landfall. And what I'm showing in this curve is this intensity past landfall. Time t equals zero is the moment of landfall. And as expected, the intensity decays very rapidly after landfall. Okay, so this is something utterly expected. Then Lynn developed another hurricane over ocean. Every parameter in the simulation is exactly the same as the curve simulation for which the curve I'm showing you right now. But the only thing that he changed for the second simulation is the environmental surroundings. He developed the second hurricane in a warmer world. This the sea surface temperature instead of about 26 degrees Celsius now was about 30 degrees Celsius. When this new, the second hurricane also reached the same intensity, about 60 meters per second, he subjected this hurricane to landfall and then evolved that hurricane again subject to the precisely same conditions. So the two hurricanes are the same except for the sea surface temperature and the environment. Well, here is the second hurricane. And as you can clearly see, the decay of the second hurricane, which developed over a warmer ocean, is considerably slower than the decay of the first hurricane. These two hurricanes, except for the 
ocean temperature and the environment that's connected with that are identical in every other aspect. But past landfall, the memory of the ocean is carried forth. He carried out a number of such simulations, varied the sea surface temperature systematically, and the result was consistent. Hurricanes that were developed over a higher sea surface temperature take longer to decay. The decay time scale is larger, the decay is slower. So the connection now becomes much clearer that the sea surface temperature indeed is connected with the decay past landfall. But we have no conceptual picture as to why this should be the case. Because the conceptual picture of the decay past landfall is simply friction with the ground. And there is nothing that connects the friction with the ground for a hurricane with what happened to a hurricane over ocean. So this was a big puzzle as to what is going on. What is the cause? We know that the sea surface temperature is the cause, but what precisely of the sea surface temperature is taken in a hurricane when a hurricane moves from ocean to land? And this is where simulations are extremely useful. Not only we are able to look at things where we just vary one parameter at a time, in this case, the sea surface temperature, but we can play God and do whatever we wish with the hurricane because the code is open. You can go and tweak around with the code. So what Lynn did was a very clever trick. For this exactly these two hurricanes, at the moment of landfall, when the intensity is about 60 meters per second, he removed all of the moisture from both the hurricanes. Remember, moisture played a crucial role when a hurricane was over ocean. And it is thought that moisture plays no role after landfall. After all, the in situ supply of moisture is cut off. Well, let's test if that's true. So when a hurricane makes landfall, he simply, for these two hurricanes, removed all of the moisture. If the framework of the spin down vortex, the swirling T model is right, we should see exactly the same curves, same two curves that we are seeing right now. But that's not what you see. So the plus symbols are for these two hurricanes, one developed over about 30 degrees Celsius, another about 26 degrees Celsius, identical to the two solid curves that I'm showing you, identical simulations, except for at the moment of landfall, all of the moisture was removed. These are dry hurricanes, so to speak. And there are two things that are extremely clear. First of all, the decay is much, much faster. So somehow the presence of moisture makes the decay slower. And the second thing is, if you remove the moisture from the hurricane, then the memory of the ocean is lost. You can see effectively the 26 degrees Celsius curve and the 30 degrees Celsius curve are but identical. They both curves are one on top of the other for the dry hurricanes. You put the moisture back in, then the hurricane that was developed over warmer ocean decays slower. So we now understand the connection between the sea surface temperature and the slower decay of the hurricane is afforded by moisture. And once that connection becomes clear, we can then go back to this curve that I'd shown earlier. So again, in black is this tau, which is the decay time scale over a 50 year time period. And in orange is the sea surface temperature. And what we can see is that sea surface temperature, the ups and downs of the sea surface temperature is connected to ups and downs of the decay time scale because warmer ocean produces more moisture and more moisture fuels a slower decay past landfall. Moisture connects a hurricane with its memory of the development over ocean. So ups and downs of the sea surface temperature, sea surface temperature going up gives more moisture, sea surface temperature going down gives less moisture. And that's what is being reflected in the ups and downs of the decay time scale. So these two are not spurious correlation, but in fact are causally related. And this is an aspect that is missing in our understanding of what happens to hurricanes after landfall. The slower decay past landfall, it obviously has many important effects. Just to give you a sense of it, if a hurricane is decaying slower past landfall, then its intensity as a function of distance from the coast, I'm plotting here, 
in the blue curve, I'm taking a typical decay time scale from 50 years ago, and I'm plotting for the intensity decay, the rapid decay of intensity of a hurricane over the first day for a hurricane that made landfall at 60 meters per second. So a category three, a category four hurricane. And for reference at different distances from coastline, uh, we have marked here a couple of uh, cities in North America. So you get a sense of well, what kind of distances are we talking about? So let's say you're in Atlanta. So about 400 kilometers away from coast. 50 years ago, a hurricane that made landfall on the coast with an intensity of 60 meters per second, uh, which is about 130 miles an hour, is going to decay down by the time it reaches Atlanta to an intensity of about 15 meters per second or about 30 miles per hour. But that was the situation 50 years ago. If a similar hurricane makes landfall now, here is the curve. Here is the curve for the decay time scale now. And what you can very clearly see is that even if the decay intensity at landfall is the same, it does not mean that the intensity that people will be experiencing further inland is going to be the same. So for the case of Atlanta again, now the intensity instead of being 15 meters per second is twice of it. It's 30 meters per second, about 70 miles an hour. So inland regions are going to face more and more intense hurricanes. That's one of the prime conclusions from our study that a warmer climate leads to a slower decay and that directly translates into more damage to inland regions. And unlike coastal regions, which may be better prepared for the onslaught of hurricanes, inland regions may be less prepared and therefore subjected to more damages from these slowly decaying hurricanes. So I've tried to describe shortly in some of the main features that we have studied uh, or Lynn has studied as a part of his PhD. Uh, if the study is of interest to you, as David mentioned at this beginning of the talk, it was published in Nature a few months ago. And at the top of the page, uh, I have the reference for the paper. And I should mention uh, that work like this would have been, practically speaking, impossible were it not for uh, funding by OIST. And what I mean by that is not just the fact that, of course, you know, resources are needed to do this kind of work. But as I mentioned at the beginning, when we started on this work, neither Lynn nor I really knew much about hurricanes. Our background is not of meteorology or atmospheric science. This is something that we were curious about and we just got interested. And it's really the freedom that's afforded by uh, places with no strings attached, well, not quite no strings, but with quite a bit of freedom uh, that funding structures like OIS provides. And it's really a privilege and it is that privilege that allows us to do work like this. I have many other people also to, to thank, but in interest of time, I just mentioned two people because they really helped us tremendously. Uh, these are two of our colleagues at OIS, Payal Shah, who is an economist. Uh, she helped us a lot, very generously. She's an absolute master of statistics. And there were many aspects of statistical analysis that was unfamiliar to us. And she very generously spent her time to explain to us what the basic ideas are and how we should implement it. Also, I should like to thank Tapan Sabuwala, who is a whiz with computational stuff, and he was instrumental in getting Lynn started and getting used to the hurricane simulations and a whole bunch of other people's all, people also. But let me stop here. I uh, thank you for your kind attention and thank you, David, again for inviting me. Well, thank you so much, Pinaki. That was a, a really, really dynamic and fascinating presentation and a uh, number of good uh, comments coming in, um, thanking you for this and also some really good questions. Uh, I wanted to, before we jump into some of the questions that the audience has, and, and Pinaki, feel free to stop sharing your screen so people can see us uh, uh, big, if you don't mind. Um, uh, it's much for me to see, but anyway, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> uh, but um, I, I thank you for, for your comments about OIST. I, I was going to ask you about that, but I think you, you kind of covered it. But um, I did want to ask just a little bit more about uh, how you, you and Lynn both decided uh, to get into this particular area of study. You 
mentioned that it is not your particular uh, focus. So what, what led to this curiosity? So uh, for me, I've been interested in uh, this area called fluid mechanics, which is how things like air, water, uh, liquids and gases flow, and particularly complicated motions, uh, what are called turbulent flows. And there are many examples in nature and hurricanes or typhoons happen to be one of the most dramatic examples of turbulent flows. So I've been interested in the topic uh, uh, from that point of view, but I hadn't really dug in uh, to try to understand what the outstanding issues are or what even the basic dynamics is. But in 2012, when I moved to Okinawa, well, Okinawa happens to be a part of the world that is not at all you know, stranger to typhoons. Uh, so I did experience and since that time I've experienced many of these typhoons. So it's very hard to be here and not get interested in the problem. Likewise, Lynn had a very similar experience, but perhaps even more alien than mine because mine, at least I had a background in fluid mechanics. Lynn came to OS from China, inland China, so he had never experienced any typhoons. And Lynn's background was physics. And when Lynn came here, uh, he was exploring different topics, uh, maybe he was thinking about going into biophysics and just by chance he happened to take a course I teach on fluid mechanics. He also happened to experience typhoons. These two purely free things got together and we started to talk about typhoons, hurricanes. I said, well, I don't know much about it, but I think there's something interesting we can do. And that was the start of this adventure. Well, thank you for that. Uh, really fascinating. And, and I think it's interesting how you talked about OIST as a kind of context that allows for this. Let me turn to several of the questions that have come in and, and I'll remind the audience that uh, please feel free to ask questions. You can write them in chat uh, or in the Q&A. Um, one of the questions is, will ocean warming affect the statistical distribution of hurricane tracks? Any thoughts on that? Yeah. So in fact, there is a, a, a connection for, uh, for example, in the North Atlantic hurricanes. So le let me mention uh, some very brief things about hurricane tracks. Hurricanes in the North Atlantic effectively take the track shapes are like a C, C shaped. Some of them get into land. Most of them fortunately stay over ocean. Now, why is a hurricane moving? A hurricane is a gigantic spinning vortex, but it happens to be embedded in a much larger scale flow, ocean basin scale flow. So it's this spinning thing that is embedded in a larger scale atmospheric wind and that's what is moving this hurricane. As the world warms, this climate change actually affects those larger scale flows also. So there is an effect of the change of these large scale flows to the tracks of hurricane. And for North America, that effectively amounts to an eastward shift in the tracks of the hurricanes. So this is something when we analyzed the hurricane decay, uh, we actually had to take into account, not just the sea surface temperature, but also the changes of track. And it so happens that near the east coast, which has higher mountains, higher elevation, more rough surfaces, if I compare that with area near the Gulf of Mexico, there is because of different land topography, the hurricane decay time scale is increased. So that's something that we also had to take into account. And basically speaking, what we found is that most of the effect of the slow decay, about 75 to 80% is coming from the sea surface temperature, but the other part is coming from change of tracks. So change of tracks is an important consideration. Very interesting. You know, your, your paper and, and research has, of course, many policy implications. And I'm just curious, you know, since you authored this, um, have, do, have policymakers re reached out to you in some way um, to begin a kind of discussion? I thought your point in particular about how coastal cities and towns may be better prepared uh, in, in many ways to handle a hurricane since they've been dealing with it for so long, but uh, cities and towns further inland may not be. Uh, so just very curious about that. So uh, as you mentioned uh, at the beginning, this paper was very widely covered in the media. 
So I was interviewed by many journalists about this paper, and this was a one constant question throughout. So mm. uh, I had to put first the caveat that I have no expertise in that area at all. So all I'm going to say about that is really something that's more or less for me, uh, common sense or guesswork. But uh, there are very, very direct implications. And one of them is, of course, higher winds. But because this higher winds is actually connected, or at least that's the case we make with, this con with moisture, there's a counterpart to this lower decay, which is what's happening to this moisture. This moisture is coming down as rain. And there is, and in fact, in the simulations, Lint analyzed what's happening to the rainfall when the sea surface temperature is increasing. Well, it turns out that the rainfall also has been increasing. And that has been an aspect that others have also studied. And when a hurricane, a landfalling hurricane causes damage, most of the damage is not directly coming from the wind. Wind causes damage, of course, and there is storm surge that is mediated by the wind, but a large part of the damage is also coming from the rain that is falling down. Very, very interesting. Uh, there are a number of questions, some of which I think may relate to this, but let, let me just read them directly. Uh, do you consider the changes of the inside structure of a typhoon or, or hurricane, um, for instance, super gradient wind? What about the effect of the local land topography on the, on the typhoon or hurricanes uh, landing? Right, so uh, the idea of super gradient wind uh, is, is, a, is the idea that uh, there is something called the gradient wind balance that tells us about how the structure of a hurricane, um, wind structure of a hurricane is, is, is there. And super gradient wind refers to the fact that the wind the intensities that we would predict from this gradient wind balance actually is lower than the observed intensity. So there is something called super gradient wind. But I should uh, clarify that in the simulations that we did, we do not impose gradient wind balance. So in fact, our simulations do show the effect of super gradient wind. So the, those kind of simplifications we did not put in, the real dynamics of the hurricane is captured by the simulation code that we use. I didn't name the simulation code. It's called cloud model one or CM1. Mm -hmm. In terms of the uh, surface drag, indeed, that's one of the factors we did study and what we find is that if you increase the surface track, so we are comparing hurricanes making landfall over smooth and over rough surfaces, there's a very, very clear effect of how the surface track affects the decay time scale. And that's something we did um, consider, we did take into account. And we suspect, although it's very hard to nail down onto one thing, we suspect that the change of hurricane track, the contribution that's coming on the DK time scale, a large part of it is actually because of the change in the surface track. Very interesting. Uh, I wanted to ask you- Maybe uh, David, I can add one more comment. Oh, please, uh, yeah. These additional effects, actually uh, the paper, well, nature allows a very short, uh, only three pages to really make your case, but it allows a very generous amount of what is called extended data. So many of these aspects and in the methods section also, we have very long discussions about many of these aspects that are, for example, the surface drag and what the results of those things are in the paper. Very interesting. And, and I put for everyone who's attending, I did put a link uh, directly to the paper in the chat. So feel free to, to look at that. And uh, you can always reach out to the OIST Foundation uh, if you, for some reason, can't find it. Um, Wanted to ask you, Pinaki, a little bit about um, maybe the future. You know, this has become uh, such a popular article, as you indicated, and we've discussed. It's been covered by the press all around the world, uh, and clearly, you and uh, Lynn, your, your co-author, are quite interested. Uh, yeah, are you thinking of somehow continuing to build on this study? Maybe looking at other regions of the world or, or, or analyzing it in a, in a slightly uh, different way? Yes, uh, so we have, we have been working on uh, building on the studies on a number of fronts. So 
in this study, we had focused largely uh, for the observational study exclusively on North Atlantic hurricanes. But it so happens that there are even more hurricanes in the Pacific Basin where we are staying. However, there are challenges uh, in terms of uh, data, quality of data, how long is the duration of data. But these are aspects that Lynn is now uh, digging into. And we are trying to study uh, whether or not there is a similar signal that one can see um, about the decay of hurricanes in these other basins, including the Western Pacific Basin. But more broadly, one of the key things that this study brings into table for consideration is that the decay of hurricane is much more interesting than just some swirling tea in a cup. There is a direct effect of moisture. So in, in this language, there is basically thermodynamical effects that are coming in here that have been neglected so far. And the moment we open up that picture, then many other aspects of hurricanes after landfall also open themselves up. Hmm. And then we can start to ask, okay, what are the other thermodynamical effects of this moisture? So a hurricane, for example, has this famous eye. When we look at a satellite image of a hurricane, there's a circular region free of clouds. So that's called the eye. And the most intense part of the hurricane is around the eye, which is called an eye wall. And in the eye region, the temperature is higher than the surrounding. So this is called a warm core of a hurricane. It's really the dynamical heart of a hurricane. Well, warm core, as the name suggests, there already is this idea of thermodynamics creating this warm core. So what happens when a hurricane makes landfall? Well, the idea was, well, you cut off the heat supply, so the warm core just decays away. But if you start to take the effect of moisture, you find that in fact, there are many, many very intricate dynamics that goes on which has direct implication on how to forecast the weather of hurricanes past landfall. So many aspects uh, Lynn has been exploring now, uh, but the leitmotif, the theme is, what's the effect of the moisture that is stored in a hurricane? Very interesting. And a fascinating question just came in. Is there a climactic effect on tornadoes, mm -hmm. uh, which of course are often associated with hurricanes? Right. So. Tornadoes and hurricanes are, uh, I mean, there are of course many similarities, but there's a huge difference, which is obviously the size. So tornadoes are extremely intense, but they are much smaller than hurricanes, which are much, much larger. And tornadoes are indeed, uh, as the questioner pointed out, uh, related with hurricanes. And in fact, more generally, they are related with storm systems. And as the, uh, storm systems become more intense, the conditions are conducive to create more intense tornadoes. But I am not aware of a direct study done about tornadoes and hurricanes and its connection with the climate. But if I have to anticipate or take a guess, I would say that as the hurricanes become more intense, I would expect them to spawn more intense tornadoes. It's very interesting. Um, maybe another future area of study for you. <laughs> uh, well, this area is really full of very interesting problems. It, it, re it really is. There, there are two other questions. Let me let me turn to those. We, we only have about five minutes left here. Uh, these always go too fast, but um, I'll just uh, read them directly and, and see what you think. Does the rate of translation of a hurricane over land affect the wind speed decay, the tau? Yes, so this is a very interesting problem. So uh, there is, as I mentioned, uh, there are many aspects of climate uh, connection with hurricane. And one of them is basically this rate of translation. So hurricane is the spinning vortex that is embedded in this large scale winds. And what uh, studies in the last couple of years have shown is that as the climate warms, the translational speed of a hurricane is slowing down. And what that means is that when a hurricane is moving through a region, it's moving through the regions more slowly. And therefore, the rain that it dumps in the region, the devastation that it causes to the region, is sub the regions are subjected to these kinds of effects for longer. That said, for the we looked at the translational speed uh, over the period of our study, which was from 1967 
to 2018. And for the landfalling hurricanes that we studied in the North Atlantic Basin, effectively, the translation speed is not changing significantly. So in the study that we did, there is not a direct effect of the slowdown of the translation speed. But what we do anticipate is that as the climate forms, translation speed will slow down. And not only there's this direct effect in terms of rain and other things being down for longer, a slowdown of a translational speed also has another direct effect, which is that as a hurricane is making landfall, it's not that at one moment it's over ocean, another moment it's over land, it takes some time. And during the time of the landfall, part of the hurricane still has access to moisture from the ocean. And if it's moving slower, the access to the moisture from the ocean is there for longer. And therefore there will be more moisture stored in the hurricane. So we anticipate a slowdown of the translational speed would directly translate into an even slower decay of the hurricane. Hmm. Very, very interesting. Let me ask one final question. Uh, since our time is nearly up, this uh, uh, participant in the webinar asks, which is more important for strengthening the hurricane, the sea surface temperature or the heat content in the upper 500 meters or so? It is the heat content in the upper 500 meters. But also important is the fact that um, the intensity of a hurricane, so what, what this um, effectively contributes to a hurricane is the amount of moisture flux that's coming in. But mm -hmm. there are some other non-intuitive parts. So the higher sea surface temperature or the higher heat content in the upper part of the ocean is a part of the thing. But up there in the tropopause, there is heat being radiated away. And as the tropopause temperature or near stratosphere, the temperature cools down, is the temperature contrast that really matters to a hurricane. And the way the heat content really matters is that when a hurricane is passing by, it cools the ocean. And it's not just the very top surface, but there's depth of the ocean that's cooled. So that's how the heat content comes in. But there are many other factors also involved. For example, shear in the atmosphere. If a hurricane is developing over region of low shear, it can intensify easily. But if there's a region of much higher shear, the intensity, the intensification is adversely affected. So it's really a sum total of a whole bunch of things. And one of the things computational simulation allows us to do is to turn off all these other kinds of things and just focus on one aspect and see what the influence of that aspect is. Well, Pinaki, thank you so much for this. You, you have uh, clearly shown that the relationship between a warming climate and hurricanes is quite different uh, from venomous spiders and uh, the words <laughs> and letters in winning the national spelling bee. I, I appreciated your um, you're pointing out uh, that there are spurious correlations, uh, but the work that you and Lynn have done is, is clearly something completely different. And um, I think this is an absolutely fascinating area of study. Let me ask if you have any final remarks you'd like to make um, before we, we close this out. Uh, sure. Uh, what I would like to say is that um, the idea of how hurricanes and climate is connected, this is, this is something that has many different aspects to the problem. And it's not something that we can just trivially say, okay, here is cause, here is effect, so on and so forth. But because if we have the privilege to explore problems, uh, we can in fact get all of these kinds of data that's available freely, anybody effectively can go in and start to study these kinds of problems. It may be that what Lynn and I found out some aspects of it over time is proven wrong. And that's just uh, the normal uh, development of science. But it was a tremendous privilege and a very interesting experience for me to be able to work with very talented students like Lynn and to be, working, to be working in an environment where we have the freedom to pursue these kinds of problems. So I, I thank everybody involved with this and I thank everybody who is listening to this talk. Well, Panaki, that, that was absolutely fabulous. Again, truly fascinating presentation. I appreciate your time and effort uh, in presenting this to all of us. I want to thank all of the attendees 
for spending uh, either their, their evening or morning uh, with us. And I uh, really look forward to um, seeing the future results of your research, Kanaki. Uh, thank you so much. And um, for those of you uh, out there in the audience, if you go to oistfoundation.org, that's oistfoundation.org, you can uh, stay in touch with us and look for uh, future webinars. There are several coming up uh, next month. And so uh, we hope you will join us for those as well. Uh, so with that, we will say uh, good night or good day. And Pinaki, thank you again so very much. Um, many amazing comments have come in in chat uh, thanking you for this excellent talk. Thank you and have a great night and good day.